fantastic to be here, to be back at Astley. It's encouraging to be invited back as well. So I come about once a year, and then I'm asked to come again, which is great to be here. I'm thankful that you affirm me by inviting me to come again. And I also want to thank you for the support that you give to my mum. So Mark, Hannah, and I are grateful of the community here that support her. I, I recognise that she supports you too, and that it's both ways. But we want to thank you for the care that, and the love that you express to her. We're going to be thinking this morning about this passage in Luke chapter 18. So if you haven't got a Bible, if you've not got a Bible on your phone, then you can grab one from the back or you can pinch one from the person next to you. And let's turn to Luke chapter 18. I know you've been in the, the Gospel of Luke for what seems like probably a long time now that this series has gone on, but it's excellent to work our way through and consider the character of Christ, consider what he did in his life on earth. So we're going to Luke chapter 18, and we're going to start to read from verse 35. As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. When all the people saw it, they also praised God. Let's just pray together before we look into that. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for all that it teaches us about your character. And we pray for each one of us that we would have open hearts this morning, that we allow you to show us truth in these scriptures for our lives that would have an impact that would let them transform us. We pray and ask this in your son's beautiful, glorious and powerful name. Amen. So I want to ask you a question as to whether you are task orientated or people focused. Perhaps it might be better to ask a colleague of yours, maybe your spouse, are you task-orientated or people-focused? I had the misfortune yesterday afternoon of going to Meadow Lane to watch Notts County play. Um, I can say that because I'm a Notts County fan, so I know that it's hard work to go and see Notts play. And yesterday, we scraped a draw against the bottom of the league in the 96th minute. So that's how, you know, how good it is. And as I walked away from the ground, I was conscious that I had to be home because mum was looking after Grace, so I had to be home to get to Grace, I had to pick Amy up from the train station. And so as I walked away from the ground, I then saw a friend um, from sixth form. So I hadn't seen him in probably about 10 or 12 years. And as I saw him, I, I said hello and I exchanged kind of a pleasantry. But I was so task orientated that I just moved on. I was like, sorry, Stuart, I've got to go. I know, daughter to pick up, um, wife to pick up from the station also. And so I just walked on. And as we think through this passage in Luke 18, and we see the character of Jesus, we want to think about what he's like, because he's the saviour, he's the one that we want to know more about, and not just in knowledge, but in relationship also. And so uh, when you last looked at the book of Luke, um, you will have read that Jesus was turning his attention to the cross. And earlier in chapter 17, so chapter 17 and verse 11, you can see that um, on the screen. I can't read the one from the back from here. So now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. So you can see um, Samaria in the, the in the middle, Galilee at the top. And so he's working his way down. And on to the next one, at Luke 18, 31. So just a few verses before this, Jesus took the 12 aside and told them, we're going up to Jerusalem. And everything that is written, about, um, written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. So this is Jesus' task. This is where he's going. 
He's set his mind to Jerusalem. He knows what's ahead for him. He knows that the cross is there. He knows um, where he's going. And then we're told at the beginning of this, as Jesus approached Jericho, so I don't know if this laser will work. Oh, it works. Oh, dear. It was working, wasn't it? I won't use it again. Um, so we can just plot Jesus' route. So he's kind of gone. He's up in Galilee. He's coming down the border to Samaria. Maybe he's along the Sea of Galilee. You know, he often did his ministry along there. And now he's touching in to Jericho. Yeah, as Jesus approached Jericho. And so that's where we find him this morning. And he meets this man. So he meets a blind man on the way to Jericho. And there's just three things about this man that we'll consider fairly quickly, what he was like, his character. Because he's, he seems to be the, the main player in this account. He seems to be the one that it's about. And so we start off by thinking that this man, this blind man, was reliant. So in verse 35, look with me in chapter 18. A blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. Now, this wasn't a choice. This wasn't, you know, he went to his careers advisor and said, you know, what am I going to be when I'm older? It's like, you're going to be a beggar. You know, that wasn't his choice. He was blind. He was an outcast from his society. And so he was reliant on others for his food, for his money, for his clothing. And so we see that this man is reliant because he's forced to beg day and night. And then in verse 36, we're told that because he's blind, he's reliant on others because he doesn't know what's happening. So he hears this commotion of a crowd coming by, and he asks them, what's happening? So he's reliant on the crowd to tell him what's going on. So this man is reliant in two ways, both in his kind of day-to-day -day needs, but also in the here and now as to what's happening. And we see going on from there, that the man is persistent. So he hears, the crowd tells him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And so the man calls out, son of David, have mercy on me. And then as he does that once, the crowd tell him to be quiet. You know, your translation might say rebuke. It might say it told him to um, shut up, if you've got a modern translation. So they don't want him to get anywhere near Jesus. The crowd who are following Jesus, the crowd who... I guess Jesus is engulfed by a saying, keep quiet, sit on the roadside. Jesus wants nothing to do with you. And yet he doesn't think, oh, okay. He keeps going. We're told that he's persistent. And so in the face of that rebuke, he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. So he was persistent because this was his profession. He was used to it, you know, day in, day out asking of people, you know, arms for the poor, arms for the blind. And so when he's put off by the crowd, he doesn't want to take no for an answer. Because right now, it's not just about day to day. It's not just about his profession. But he knew that something more was at stake. And we recognize what inspired his persistence. And actually, Dave's introduction of that song, um, he's the king of kings, he's the lord of lords, now, who is this man? Well, who do the crowd say that the man is? So in verse 37, it's Jesus of Nazareth. They've completely missed the point, haven't they? Jesus of Nazareth. He's just a man. He's just a bloke from Nazareth who's walking around, and he seems to be doing things that are special, and so we're following him. But the blind man, we're told, calls out, Jesus, son of David. Jesus, son of David. And uh, this is a title that the Old Testament refers to as a title for the Messiah. So a title for the one who was to come, the promised one of God who was going to restore relationships, who was going to bring back Israel, who was going to draw people to God. This man got it. This man is outside the crowd following Jesus. And yet he knew more about who Jesus was than the crowd. And so because of that, because he knew that this what if it was just Jesus of Nazareth, great. I don't want to talk to him. I don't want to meet him. But this man knew him as Jesus, son of David, Jesus, the Messiah. And so he keeps crying out. He knew that he wanted to meet Jesus. And we see just in these few verses that the man is so opportunistic. He wants to make the most of this opportunity. 
He sat there day in, day out, not seeing anybody, maybe not being given anything. And yet he knows there's an opportunity now to meet Jesus. And, you know, in thinking about how this was working, I guess in terms of logistics, you know, in some of the films that you'll watch or some of the um, portrayals of this account, they'll have Jesus at the front of the crowd. But I don't think Jesus could have been at the front of the crowd because the crowd put the man off Jesus. And so if Jesus was at the front, he wouldn't have rebuked him. So Jesus is somewhere in the middle of this throng um, of people, and he wants to see the man. So Jesus stopped, we're told in verse 40, and ordered the man to be brought to him. So the man can't be close. So who, who knows how many people deep it is around Jesus. And so Jesus orders the man to come, and we see his reliance again, um, that he has to be brought to Jesus. So this blind man, he's reliant upon the others now to take him to Jesus. And he must have been persistent to get through the crowd. And he takes his opportunity. Jesus asks him in verse 41, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see. Lord, I want to see. And in those five words, we see more about the character of this man. So he recognizes who Jesus was. We know he's already called him son of David, so the Messiah. And yet in his first word, he calls him Lord. So he recognized Jesus as Lord. He's the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. The priority, the first choice, the number one. Lord, I want to see. Given the opportunity to meet the Messiah, the chosen one of God, he asks big. He doesn't say, um, you know, could you just help me out? He's not sort of vague and unspecific. He says, I want to see. And he asks that because he knows that Jesus can do it. So he knows there's an opportunity because this is the Messiah, and he grasps it. And I was thinking about this and getting carried away. I'm thinking it's like it would be like playing five-a-side football and having Lionel Messi come and be part of your team and saying, do you know what, Lionel? Go in goal for us. We need a keeper. It's like having Mary Berry in your kitchen. And Mary Berry says, what do you want me to do? And you say, can I just have a pancake? Or having J.K. Rowling at your desk to write something for you. And you say, just write me a tweet. Just 140 characters, that'll do. And if any of those situations and any that you could think of came by, you'd think, oh, I missed an opportunity there. And the blind man doesn't miss an opportunity. He grasps it. He wants to be healed. And he shows humility in his request. So Lord, so he recognizes that it's Jesus' choice as to whether he can see. And then in his response to being healed, we see humility. In verse 43, so, well, in verse 42, Jesus says, receive your sight, your faith has healed you. Immediately, he, his sight, he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. So this man wasn't just after all that he could get. I want to be healed, and then I'm just going to leave. We're not told that Jesus told him to follow him, but that man, that blind man, knew that it was the right response, knew that in response to God's uh, gracious provision of his sight back, that the only and right response was to follow Jesus. And he doesn't just follow Jesus for the man that he is, as Jesus of Nazareth, but he follows Jesus and praises God. So he follows Jesus and praises God. And what does that do to the crowd? When all the people saw it, they also praised God. You know, you could look at this account and think, actually, it's the, it's the account of the blind crowd. Because the crowd said, this guy is Jesus of Nazareth. He's just a man who we're following about. And yet it's the, it's the testimony of the man receiving his sight from Jesus, who knew who Jesus was who asked of him and who received his sight back and then followed and praised him. It was his influence on the blind crowd that helped them see. They praised God. They brought glory to the Father. So there's humility from that man. And so when we look at the beggar, and when I was looking in terms of preparing for, for this talk, this sermon, if you look earlier in chapter 18, we see that this man is actually a, 
He's living out parables that Jesus taught. So just uh, split with me or swipe with me if you're on your phones to the beginning of chapter 18. So Jesus is telling his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. And we read this account of the persistent widow who goes to the judge and is asking for putting his, her case to him. And so Jesus, when he's unpacking this parable, says, and will not God bring, uh, listen to what the unjust says, and will not God bring about justice, in verse 7, for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night. You know, this beggar, day and night, crying out for, for money, crying out to God for provision, day and night. This man was a chosen one of God himself. And God was merciful and gracious to him. He, was, he always praised and he never gave up. And then in verse 8 of chapter 18, Jesus says, I tell you, he will see that they get justice. So God will see that his people get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? So Jesus calling himself out as the Son of Man, will he find faith on the earth? And we see in the passage that we read together that he finds it in this man. Receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. So this man lives out that parable of the persistent widow, of asking of God, persistently, purposely, crying out to God and receiving mercy. And then we see it in the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Again, Jesus is teaching um, so it says in verse 9 of chapter 18, to some who are confident of their own righteousness and look down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. And we see that the tax collector in verse 13 says, God have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus says, I tell you that this man rather than the other went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. God have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And he cried out louder, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus taught these parables about what, um, what God was like and what the people who God uh, loved and wanted to be in relationship were like. And this man is a living example to me and to you about what it means to follow God, to love Jesus. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. So when we think about are you task-orientated or people-focused, what about Jesus? What about Jesus? You know, it seems that the blind man is the main player in these few verses. But actually, Jesus is the one. He's the key. He's the starring role. He's the main attraction. And was he task-orientated or people-focused? Well, in, uh, you would have done this months and months ago, so let me refresh your memories. So in Luke chapter 4, at the very beginning of his public ministry, Jesus goes to the temple, and he, uh, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, so Luke 4 and verse 17, was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoner and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on Jesus. And he began by saying to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. This scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. You know, we see Jesus living out his task, giving sight to the blind. We see that in the, ma in the man. But there's so much more happening here because it's about proclaiming the year of the Lord's favor. So it's about three years since Jesus said this to when we're in chapter 18. And so it wasn't Jesus saying, you know, God's favor is for a year. It's for 365 days and then it's going to be finished. But actually, it, it's the first year of it continuing on of God's kingdom being present and breaking out into the community. And we see it in the man who has his sight come back. It was a sign of what's to come. The healing of the man showed that Jesus had the power 
And in Luke 10, we see Jesus living out this parable. So again, you've, you've looked at this as a community, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But Luke 10 is the Good Samaritan on the Jericho Road. Where was Jesus going to? He was going to Jericho. Jesus on the Jericho Road. He had opportunity to leave that man, to walk on the other side. The crowd didn't want to know. Be quiet, shut up, sit down. Jesus wants nothing to do with you. Is Jesus people uh, task-orientated or people-focused? No, excellently, he's both. Because his task was people, and his task still is people. It's giving freedom for the oppressed, giving sight to the blind, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So Jesus intentionally sought out this man. He said, bring him to me, because he's a chosen one of God. And so what do these verses from kind of first century Israel have to do with you and with me? What impact are they going to have on our lives? Well, isn't it great to know that Jesus is people-focused? Isn't it great to know that he cared enough in the middle of a crowd of, who knows, hundreds, thousands? He wanted to know that man, and he wanted to meet that man. And he gave him free reign to ask whatever he wanted. What do you want me to do for you? He could have asked absolutely anything. And the man replied, Lord, I want to see. You know, whatever it is that feels like it's your blindness, so whatever it is that feels like it's your struggle today, Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? And I recognize even in saying this that it is hard for us, isn't it? Because when we read about the blind man and we read Jesus saying, receive your sight, your faith has healed you, you know, for some of us, there are things that we've prayed day in, day out, year after year. The things day in, day out that we've wanted Jesus to do for us that haven't been done. And some of you have lived with that for decades. But for longer than I've been alive. And so I have no right to tell you that, and I wouldn't tell you that your faith isn't strong enough for that. So we can sit here and think, what is our faith like? And we can beat ourselves up, can't we, and think, my faith's not big enough. My faith in Jesus isn't strong enough. And so that leads us to walk away and say, I can't do this. Or it leads us to get angry with God and say, why are you not hearing me? Why are you not um, doing as I, as I want? Or a response, and we thought about this at the, the communion service this morning, of our response being joy, of rejoicing in the Lord always. Because it's not about our requests, but it's about God's character. And God is true, and God is just, and God is perfect in all his way. And we sing that in songs, and we need to know and mean it. Not just in our hearts, but to, to get what that means in our heads. And to live that out each day relationally with him. So how you respond today isn't to, to beat yourselves up and say, oh, I don't have the faith for that. But Jesus knows you better than you know yourself already. So those things, um, I saw there's a book on the back that Mike's got in that's kind of dealing with disappointment. So maybe for some of you, you might, you might read that and it might help you. Uh, Amy and I have read a, a great book by Pete Gregg from 24-7 Prayer called God on Mute. Um, I'd encourage you, if you're dealing with unanswered prayer, then read that and it's an excellent, uh, honest account uh, of what it means to keep living in the truth that Jesus is King of Kings. Jesus is Lord of Lords. Victory is ours. Uh, he frames it by talking about Easter. And, you know, we have Good Friday, we have Easter Saturday, and then we have Easter Sunday. And you can find yourself on one of those days in a situation. Man, it always feels like it's Good Friday. It always feels like it's just death and it's just painful. Or you, you, you move into Easter Saturday and you're like, what's going on? I don't, is something happening? Is God moving? Is Jesus going to come back? And then it moves on to kind of victoriously Easter Sunday. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. 
So as we think on about um, who Jesus is, what's revealed to us about him in this. You know, the, the blind man, and I'll try and navigate backwards to make sure this goes for me. So the blind man was reliant, he was persistent, and he was opportunistic. And in that way, he gives us just a glimpse of Jesus' character. That Jesus was reliant. You know, we, we read in John that Jesus said, I only do what I see my father doing. I only do what I see my father doing. So his father was about healing. And so Jesus got on board and did with that. But he only, not sometimes I do what my father asked me to do, but I only do what I see my father doing. So he was reliant on God for who is going to meet, for where he's going to meet them in the route that he was going to take on his way to Jerusalem, going via Jericho. We see that Jesus was persistent. You know, that crowd around him, bring that man to me. Bring that man to me who's calling out to me as son of David. And Jesus took the opportunity. He had the man right there. He said, what do you want me to do with you? And he took the opportunity to heal. So as we think on who Jesus is and as we think about what difference it makes for us. Let's remember that this is true of God. And we want it to be true of our own lives and our own day to day. I'm just going to pray for us and just lead us in a moment of kind of reflection on these, uh, these passages and these words. So let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for this blind man. We thank you for his example of faith to us. Of someone who was persistently crying out, both to the community, but to you as well. We thank you that he just kept on going and going. That he didn't stop. And that when he had the opportunity, that when he had the moment, he took it. He knew what you could do and he knew who you were. More importantly, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that his task was to bring people back to you. His task was to proclaim the favour of the Lord. To bring people into relationship with you. To heal the sick. To give sight to the blind. And thank you that the year of your favour is on and on and on. And is still today. That we can proclaim the year of your favour. And so we ask, Lord, that you would help us to do that. You'd help us to be persistent in coming to you with the things that we long for. That we'd be ready for the moment when you ask us, what what do you want of me? You give us faith. But Father, we pray and we thank you that you give us grace. That you know us better than than we know ourselves. You know what we need. And so we ask that you'd help us to live with that day by day. And and I ask, Lord, that you'd help this this community, this church community here, both as a gathered one on a Sunday, but as a present one in the community that surrounds it. That there would be opportunities there to, to reach out and to make the most of opportunities to love and serve one another and our community. And yet, even when it's difficult, even when the the testimony feels like Good Friday, that you would help us to to look forward to Easter Sunday. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you set out for Jerusalem and you didn't turn back. That you went to the cross and you died. And that you rose again on the third day. And that ultimately that proclaims God's favour in so many ways. And so we ask that we would make the most of the opportunities that you have and that you long for us. We thank you for your love shown to us, expressed in Jesus, and the presence of your Holy Spirit with us each day that allows us and brings out of us the cries 
of Abba, Father. And at times that's all we feel like we can cry. But Holy Spirit, we thank you that you make even that possible.